There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Well, first of all, uh, stop putting your money in prison. That's the first step you need to take. Stop locking your money away in a 401k at a company employer where you can't access it. Now, if you have your own Roth IRA or IRA, maybe you can do some things with that, but it won't create passive income now unless you're at least 59 and a half years old. So don't put your money in prison. Don't lock it up in equity by trying to pay off your house aggressively because it gets locked up. You can't get it out unless you ask the bank for permission. And right now with interest rates, do you really want to be asking for that kind of permission? So Stop that. Stop putting extra money into prison where it gets locked up. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. Did you know that passive income is one of the best ways to build wealth? It sounds pretty good, but passive income also has some flaws. The problem is when most people talk about passive income, it isn't actually passive income. Like if you bought a business where you actually have to work to make that money. The true definition of passive income is to have money coming in when you aren't working. Like when you're sleeping and snuggled in your bed in your comfy PJs. That sounds pretty great to me, but how do you actually build passive income? That's where our guest, Chris Miles, the cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor comes in. He has used his passive income skills to become financially independent twice and paid off over a million dollars in debt after last recession without filing for bankruptcy. In this episode, Chris is sharing how to create multiple streams of passive income on virtually any budget. 
why traditional financial advice sucks, and why true wealth can't come from a scarcity mindset of saving and only contributing to your retirement accounts, contrary to what the Dave Ramseys of the world spews to millions of people. You won't want to miss Chris's very candid take on this. This episode will have you thinking outside of the box when it comes to building wealth, and as always, take what works for you and leave the rest. Let's start talking. Chris, I am so thrilled to have you join us on the podcast. You were on the podcast, I believe it was last year, and I thoroughly loved the episode. I was so inspired after our conversation, and so I'm excited to have you back on to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Absolutely, Sean. I'm really excited to be back on. It's such an honor to be here. We're talking about passive income, which is something that everyone is, is, is talking about. Everybody wants to have passive income. And I think there's no better time than right now for everyone listening to kind of figure out this, this passive income thing, right? Everything is costing mm-hmm. more. We have historic inflation. Student loan repayment is, is starting again. And we're all just trying to live life and, and spend money you know, after the pandemic. So we got a lot of interesting things going on. And last time we were on the show, we talked all about creating cash flow. And this time we're looking really directly at passive income, which I know both of those are really correlated, but we're shining the light on passive income. So you're the expert. You know, tell us how can passive income, how can this really just change our lives? You know, it's, uh, it's kind of like Warren Buffett says, you know, if you don't make money while you sleep, you're going to work until you die, right? Yeah. And the key with passive income is that it's nice to have that always coming in, be able to have money coming in when you work, when you don't work, you know, and that's the real true definition of passive, right? You know, there's a lot of people out there that'll say things like, well, you know, like I teach passive income and then maybe they're like real estate investors, but then you dig a little deeper and you find out, no, you're just teaching me how to create a part-time or full-time business. That's not passive at all. You know, and you get some other people mm, say, right. oh, create passive income. And then it's another, some like online type business or something like that. And when I talk about passive income, it's really legitimately passive, meaning that you get your money working for you. In fact, working harder for you. So you have to work so hard for it, right? It's your money is being invested in places. You're not doing the investing in the sense, although you might be partnering with somebody, but somebody else is doing the work. You're just getting paid the returns. It's interesting because you're a formal financial advisor. We're going to talk about this. I'm a non-practicing certified financial planner. So mm-hmm. we have a lot in common there. But as you're talking about this idea of passive income, it makes me think about uh, my dad, who's in his 80s, who has been in the financial industry his whole career, who I would say is pretty old school financial <laughs> planner, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we would drive by, like, let's say a gym together, you know, midday, 12 o'clock. And he'd be like, what are all these people doing at the gym? Shouldn't they be working? <laughs> And so I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, for, for some, somebody listening right now, because I think there's still that, you know, I, I don't know, I feel like it's a false money belief that we have to always just be slaving away at our job mm-hmm. and earning money that way. And what you're talking about, right, is you're inviting us into, no, there's, there's a different way of doing this. There really is. Yeah. It, when you say that, it takes me back. I mean, from his perspective, you know, 20 years ago, I was a financial advisor and it, the epiphany for me was when I was sitting down with my dad, you know, we were sitting down at his table. Uh, now he was the one that taught me how to be the, the nice penny pinching saver in my life. Right? right. Yes. You know, hard worker, you know, he even say, but he also had scarcity about money. He would say things like, you know, money doesn't grow in trees. You know, what do you think I am made of money? You know, like I can't afford this. And so I would always grow up with that. And I vowed never to become that person. And then I became a financial mm. advisor later in life. And I thought if I can bring back my, you know, give dad my my, his life back, right? To be able to give him some extra time. Cause he literally thought he would work until he died. You know, he could never Oh yeah, save my dad that. too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it was a, such a miserable existence in a sense. And then um, I'm sitting down with him as a financial advisor. He decided to ask me for advice for once. And he was 61 years old. I sat down at his table and I'm looking over his numbers and he says, all right, Chris, what else can I do? You know, and he'd saved in his 401ks. He'd paid off his house early. Very proud of that. Debt free everything that Dave Ramsey would blush and be proud of, right? And, and <laughs> Can then we just I pause looked at him for and a said, moment Dad? and laugh at that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like I said, Dad, listen, um, if I were to be blunt, if you didn't have social security, you better hope you die in five years because that's how much money you have left. Like that's really all you've been able to save is five years worth of expenses. Okay, Chris, oh. that's not what I wanted to hear. I know. Okay, what do I do? 
I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. And it was a really hard thing to, to come out of, right? Just to be, and I realized at that point, not only was he not become financially free, even after doing everything right, when I started looking at my own clients, they weren't financially free. Look at all the financial advisors who were supposed to have it figured out like us, right? And we weren't financially free based on just the mutual funds. You know, obviously people would, um, there's many advisors that might make good money off the assets under management, but if you took that away, they'd be just as broke as right. anybody else. And, and that was the big epiphany for me. And that's why I started searching. I'm like, well, how do people do it? You know, like, just like your dad said, wait, how are people even able to do this stuff? And I found people that were in, retired in their 20s and 30s, financially independent, and they were primarily in the business of like real estate. You know, either they're in business and or they're investing in real estate and, and things like that, alternative investments, the things that we couldn't offer as financial advisors. And, and that's the big shift, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a client on my show recently, Dan. Uh, he came on when he first started with us and he said, yeah, I just retired as being the fourth ranking colonel in the, the California National Guard. He's like, I got a million bucks, got it, you know, but my financial advisor says I'm going to have to live on 30,000 a year because you can only pull off 3%. Right. And he's like, that's not a life for me. I don't want that. And that's the accumulation mindset. What had to shift for me when I was a financial advisor to transitioning away from that, as well as for anybody listening to this right now, is you got to transition away from that accumulation, hoarding, saving type of mindset where savers are losers and instead get into more a cash flow passive income mindset which is what Dan had to do. And so with Dan, just to give you an update, after six months, uh, he I just came back on my show recently and he said, okay, Chris, here's what happened. A million dollars, we deployed it. We did some real, you know, bought some real estate properties that are being managed by somebody else. I put some investment into an apartment deal. I did some investments into like this mineral rights, oil and gas type of investment, but it's land-based, not just drilling-based. And uh, he's like, right now, I'm creating $11,000 a month of passive income. He's like, I'm wow. financially independent. And he's like, you know what I'm doing? He's like, I'm doing projects and, and working as an independent contractor doing fun stuff. <laughs> in fact, he did his interview from the job site out in like near Truckee, you know, you know up there in the mountains right, and stuff. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, now I just work by choice. I'm work optional. And I think that's the ultimate goal is that you can keep working if you want to. That's in fact, many Americans want to keep doing something that they feel is purposeful or useful, but uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be in a place where you're having to get that paycheck each and every month. I really like that shift in thinking. I mean, for me, it's very powerful because we're not taught this, mm -mm. We're, right? We're taught, like, put your money in your 401k, uh, get your match, do, you know, check all those boxes, and then, you know, just wait to the day you retire, start taking some money out, you got a little social security, and, you know, figure out then what to do with the rest of your life. And I think, a lot of the younger generations are like, wait a minute, that is ridiculous. I don't want to live that way, but I don't exactly know what to do to, to change it. You know, and I, I really believe your advice that mainstream financial advice, it does suck. It doesn't <laughs> help you create wealth. That's but funny. I want to play a little bit of like devil's advocate here. If we look on the flip side, are there any circumstances where getting financial advice actually does make sense? Traditional financial advice? You know, to a degree. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah. yeah. There, you know, there's the basic stuff. Like, for example, people, you know, often know me as kind of ripping on Dave Ramsey specifically, just because he is one of those financial gurus out there. That's the ultimate saver mentality, which is a scarcity mentality. And just so you know, you can't ever be truly financially free having that scarcity mentality. Now, here's what's interesting <laughs> is uh, I actually recently saw an interview with, with Dave Ramsey and um, uh, I'm blanking on the, the, YouTuber's name. Uh, he's an influencer out there. Uh, but he decided <laughs> to open his books and let Dave Ramsey look at it and give him advice. And, and understand that I already knew this going in, uh, but I was surprised that Dave Ramsey was public to even talk about this. Now, see, Dave Ramsey, if you don't know what he teaches, he teaches about budgeting, saving, paying off all your debt, being debt free, because you, know, you can't be happy and, and a Christian if you're not debt free, which is BS. Um, Thank you. All that yes. kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, and, and there is a half truth to what he says too. I'm not saying it's full BS. I'm just saying it's half BS, you know, um, but you know, he teaches all this stuff. And again, he's a great guy, very kind hearted, has blessed so many lives. Like, there's no doubt, especially if you're more like in the remedial financial stage, meaning like, you know, when you go to college and they have like the 101 class, which is the intro class, um, his advice would be like the 99 R. You know, it's like the, this is the class you got to take just so you can take the intro class, right? 
Right. And so right. the advice he gives, the basic stuff of, you know, learning how to track your money, learning how to save and start having an emergency fund and things like that is good advice. Even just the having the habit of saving is good advice. That's the part of financial advising I do like. Where it goes wrong is how to create wealth. See, if you're just trying to get the zero, that's one thing. If you're just trying to barely make ends meet, that's another. Um, but like Dave Ramsey, what we saw here with this interview is that normally he's telling people, you know, pay off all your debt, you know, sell off everything, you know, or whatever, except for, you know, just have this paid off house and, and be living on a budget. Well, this guy had millions of dollars. He's worth, I think, roughly about 15 to $20 million. He opens his portfolio. The only bad, you know, the bad criticism that Dave gives, and even it's a little bit um, kind of, uh, you know, tongue in cheek. It wasn't like really outright. It was kind of more passive. But he just said, he's like, yeah, well, you know, the only, th- only problem here is you have a few properties that are, you know, that aren't debt free. So I can tell which properties you love the most. <laughs> so that was like his little <laughs> passive statement, but not the usual, you know, in your face, fi- hellfire and damnation, Dave Ramsey. And what Dave said is this. He said, listen, he's like, he's like, I think you should invest in things you love, you know, things that you know a lot about. He's like, for me personally, Dave speaking here, he's like, for me personally, I invest in my business. I invest in real estate. He's like, and then I like mutual funds. He's like, that's what I like. This other guy didn't really do a whole lot with mutual funds. He's like, you know, I have people I know that they don't do mutual funds and that's fine. He's like, I think real estate's great. I think you should do real estate investing. Now notice he's talking to a guy that has more money. The problem is his audience, the people he's meant for, my wife knows because she actually was trained um, in, in his facility. She actually was trained there in Tennessee by, his t- by him and his team, met Dave and everything. She's like, Dave doesn't live by those same rules. He lives by different rules than what he teaches. He lives by the rules right. that we talk about on our show, which is more building your wealth, uh, not gambling it away, which you know, that's one thing I do disagree. I think mutual funds are a gamble. I think they are mediocre returns with high risks, and I don't think they're worth it. Um, but are they better than doing nothing? Could be, depending if you get in the up market or the down market like right now. Um, but it could be. And so that's the thing with, with Dave is that he's, teaching, he's talking to this guy saying, you know what? Yeah, I keep doing this. Business is a great investment. Real estate is a great investment. He should be saying that from day one, in my opinion. But I know his market is for the broke people. The problem is the people that listen to him are the people that already have believed the way that he is taught. They, he only justifies what they're already doing. They're already savers. They're already putting their money in mutual funds and 401ks. But the truth is, is that if they want to create real wealth, they can't keep doing that. The 401k won't get you there. You don't hear people that save their way to great wealth in 401ks. Um, and I, I know I'm rambling here, but you know, another art, I ran into an article I found recently I shared on my podcast where uh, the, uh, there was a, four case studies, four people that had saved roughly about $2 million in their retirement plans. Interesting thing, almost every single one of them, none of them were able to save totally in their retirement plans. All of them had pensions or something other kind of bonus that ah. paid out. It wasn't from saving retirement, even though they would max fund their 401ks and they'd get the matches. They never built up the full $2 million with saving in those mutual funds. So think about this. These are the people that have beyond the median. The median 401k balance is about $80,000 right now. I don't say the average because averages get skewed, but the person, if you take the person right in the middle, has an $80,000 balance in their 401k. If you have to live off 3% of that, that's twenty. But that's not even twenty four thousand. That's twenty four hundred dollars a year you're living on. Even those people with two million living on three percent, it's sixty thousand a year. And the crazy thing is, all four of those people, other than the eighty four year old, uh, he wasn't as bad. But three of the four people um, were scared of running out of money. The eighty four year old just figured he would die first. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if that's evidence, why should we be criticizing this? Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, okay, let, let's let get a little like soup to nuts here because I think everyone listening, they're, they're probably like me and they're like, okay, how do we do this though? So mm-hmm. let's say we, we have been putting in money in our 401k. Maybe we have some savings. Um, you know, maybe we've got a small chunk of cash somewhere. How do we take what we've got almost at like any dollar amount and actually turn that into passive income? Like what should we be investing in or what should we be looking at? Well, first of all, uh, stop putting your money in prison. That's the first step you need to take. Stop locking your money away in a 401k at a company employer where you can't access it. Now, if you have your own Roth IRA or IRA, maybe you can do some things with that, but it won't create passive income now unless you're at least 59 and a half years old. So don't put your money in prison. Don't lock it up in equity by trying to pay off your house aggressively because it gets locked up. You can't get it out unless you ask the bank for permission. And right now with interest rates, do you really want to be asking for that kind of permission? So stop that. Stop putting extra money into prison where it gets locked up. Second step is then figure out where can I put my money? Now, if you only got, if you're just starting out, you're just starting to save, you have 10,000 bucks. Okay. That's your emergency fund, right? Or at least 20, maybe 30 plus thousand dollars should be your emergency fund. Start there. Now, there is a strategy that I teach called infinite banking that can help people build up their cash and do things using whole life insurance instead of just the point nothing percent savings account. Uh, there are ways to create very low fee life insurance policies that actually allow you to build up your cash faster. And then you can invest with it and double dip, and essentially make your money in two places at the same time. But, um, but once you start to build up some cash, maybe you got hundred grand, 200 grand or so in savings, then it's a matter of trying to find the right deals. Now that's the tough part. Um, and you know, that's why we, you know, even for our clients, you know, when we have them you know, consulting with us one-on-one. I mean, that's typically what they're looking for. They're looking for some sort of guidance and connections to those deals. And you can find your own. Like for example, you know, a type of investment I think would be um, generally speaking safer for the average person getting started is looking up what are called turnkey real estate companies. Now I'll just say okay, that I'd yeah. say the ma- majority of turnkey real estate companies right now don't have great cash flow currently because of those interest rates, especially if you're trying to buy with a mortgage. Some of them you could buy outright with cash. Um, better ones usually have at least a 10% cash on cash return, which means if you pay, say, $100,000 for a property, you would be earning $10,000 a year or roughly about 800 and some odd dollars a month. Um, to give you a real life example, I just had one show up from one of our providers that uh, his property, it was a property out in Texas, out in Northeast Texas. And uh, this property was $110,000. 
but the, the actual value is 120,000. So you buy with 10,000 instant equity. So you have a little bit of safety there. And then the cash flow, even after you pay their property management fees, because they manage the property for you. So we give you an to let you know what a turnkey company does. They help you find the property. So you're not just looking on the MLS yourself, trying to find it, you know, find properties on your own. They help you find the property. If you need financing, they help you get financing. And then they help property manage it for you. So they're actually doing the work. You're the one just collecting the checks. Um, they're the ones mm. even finding the renters. They're the ones dealing with any issues that come up. There's big issues, like maybe like there's a big maintenance repair cost. They might ask you for permission first before charging you. But, uh, but for the most part, you're buying these properties that are, you know, if they're done right, freshly renovated. Um, so you're not worrying about repairs right off the bat. Uh, and they have a renter in place right off the get-go. So the great thing is like this one, this property, $110,000, but you're making $930 a month after paying their property management fees. So you're making this 10% return, which has tax advantages. And that doesn't include anything about appreciation or any other benefits there. So is real estate still one of the best ways to create passive income? Or is that changing a little bit because of you know, the market conditions we're in right now? This is where I'm going to paraphrase Robert Kiyosaki, which says there's no risky investments, only risky investors. <laughs> um, see, when I, the, the problem I see is that most people, when they try to do it, they try to do it on their own off the get-go. They, they look for like a real estate property in their own backyard. And they'll say, right, well, how right. do people make money? Because I live in California and it's really hard to make money. Like my mortgage payment is going to be higher than my rent. And the answer is yes, duh, because nothing in the Western half of the United States looks good right now. <laughs> so there's pockets of the United States that do look better. Now, when I buy properties, I, I live in Utah. I don't buy anything in Utah. I don't buy it in my backyard because rents just stink in comparison to what I have to pay, the, pay for the price. So I buy properties like in Alabama, you know, in Tennessee and you know, Missouri or North Carolina, places like that, you know, places that are really unassuming. And, and so, yeah, it can be risky if you don't know what you're doing or you're just trying to buy something because you heard real estate was a good deal. This is why Rich Dad Poor Dad can be dangerous, that book, right? By Robert Kiyosaki, yeah, yeah. because you know, in that book, people get the conclusion, they say, oh, I should buy real estate. I'm going to go buy real estate. And then they do it, but they do it incorrectly. And that could be the most costliest mistake they ever make. So, so is it, you know, overall, do I think it's risky? No. Um, but if not done properly, it can be it can actually end up creating a lot of stress for you. So what is real estate done incorrectly? Is that just buying a property where there's absolutely no return? Absolutely. It's it's all about cash flow. Never ever buy a property based on the the potential value it could be, like appreciation or what it could grow to be. That's where most people usually make the mistake or because they just want that rental property, they think it's cool to get it. But then when they do when they finally do the numbers, they realize they're not making any net profit. So like any business, right? Uh, if you think of it from a business perspective, a business is more valuable and happier when it has profit. Even at home, you're happier when you have a lot more income coming in than your expenses, right? No different with real estate. You want to make sure you have extra profit, not just a few bucks. You want to have as much as possible. And that's what that cash on cash return means. It means what's, your, what's the money you came out of pocket and what's your net profit coming off of that deal? So if you come out of pocket, say for a down payment on a property of $40,000, you know, I would hope I'm making at least three to $400 a month. That's what I hope for. Um, and, that's, and that's after everything's paid. Mortgage payment, if you have a mortgage payment, taxes, insurance, any other fees, property management fees, and everything. Now, if you're managing it yourself, you better, I would say, go for at least 1% a month, which would be 12% a year. So if you come out of pocket 40000 you better be making at least 400 500 net profit a month if you're trying to manage it yourself. Personally, I think that's crazy, but there are some people that actually <laughs> like doing it. Um, so it's, that's the key is that the numbers have to work up front. You got to know up front what the numbers are. And that's why if you find a good turnkey real estate company, and I know we have in our network about six of them, um, if you, and two of them we're actually referring to right now, while the other four, not so much. Um, and if you have, find a good company, you know, you're going to find better deals and you're going to know up front what you're going to make. It's not going to be so mysterious. And that's just one type of passive investments. Yeah, I, I want to move on and talk about some others. But before the, we do that, I just have one kind of follow up question. I'm wondering if, uh, is there ever a point in time, let's say you have these couple properties, one or two properties, is there ever a point in time when you 
decide to sell these or is mm. the objective as long as they're creating passive income that it's it's a win? Ooh, that's a good that's a good question. Um yeah, because there's a thing called return on equity. And all that means is how much equity do you have in the property versus how much is that profit per year? And so give you an example. I had a client in California, of course. Um, it's usually the Californians. Whenever somebody on the West Coast, <laughs> Oregon, Washington, California, they say, hey, I've got property. I say, great, sell it. You don't know the numbers. I'm like, I already know. <laughs> I, already, <laughs> I already know the numbers. You got, if you have equity, assuming you have equity, um, that the numbers are going to be better selling that property. Uh, so in this case, this guy's case, um, he had a property that had about 700000 of equity. But his net profit after he paid his, his mortgage payment and everything else was $200 a month. Now he had the wow. accumulation mindset focus, right? He was looking at it. Now, at first he thought he was doing fine. He's like, yeah, yeah, Chris, I got real estate. I'm good. But then when I looked at it, I said, wait a minute, you're only making 200 bucks a month off this? Well, yeah, it's profitable, but don't worry. In six years, I'm going to have this paid off. I'll be debt free <laughs> and then it'll be 2,200 a month. I said, well, that's fine. But here's the deal. We could sell that property right now, take that 700,000. We can do a tax-free exchange into other properties. And even if we only earned 10% on that, that's $70,000 a year. You're currently making $2,400 a year. Even if you paid off the house eventually, right, and made it debt-free, quote unquote, you're still only cash flowing about $26,000 a year. And that's not for five years plus down the road. So why not make $70,000 a year today where we keep reinvesting that? Eventually, after five or six years, when you're supposed to be debt-free on the other property, you'll have about $100,000 of passive income coming in instead of twenty six. And I it like was those numbers better. <laughs> much better. You know, it's hard for wrap his brain around, but that's what I mean by return on equity. If you do the math, twenty four hundred from seven hundred thousand, he was making less. I mean, he was making like 0.3% on his money. So even though he was profitable compared to what he originally bought it for, because it appreciated and it kept growing and he was paying down the mortgage at the same time, or really his renters were paying down the mortgage for him, um, it got to the point where it just was ridiculous to keep that property. Okay. So Tell me a little bit about some of these other ways that we could create passive income. Like what are some of your other clients dipping their toes into? Yeah, there's several. I mean, uh, there's apartments. You can invest in apartments. Now, the good news, you don't have to buy it yourself. Uh, it's not that big of a, a, ju a jump for you. Um, you can actually go in together with other people, which is usually referred to as a syndication. Um, so those syndications, those syndicated deals is really a business partnership where everybody pools their money together to buy a specific property, and then you earn the profits from it, the cash flow, the profits, and everything. Um, you're not the one managing it or operating it. Somebody else is doing that, and they're usually taking a certain cut of the, of the returns and or fee to do that, but you get the, all the profits. So pretty much like you're getting, you're basically really passive in that sense. You're not doing squat, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, you're really just putting your money in, and that's it. And so uh, we had one recently. This one was exceptional. Um, one of my one of my contacts had you know two two separate complexes in Michigan and two different suburbs outside of Detroit. So it was actually a two apartment complex deal. And that one he was offering what's called a sixteen percent preferred return. Preferred return just means that they pay you a minimum of that return every year, um, even as it's trying to get profitable. So these people were making four percent a quarter on this. And then any potential profits on the back end as well. Um, that's a, another example recently that people were jumping all over. Most of the time, usually, you know, those kind of deals, at least 10 or 15% can be pretty typical. Um, although those preferred returns in many cases with um, deals I've seen, it might be like 7 or 8% where they pay you a minimum return and then you get any profits on top of it, especially if it sells. Um, so in apartments is one. Self-storage units is another. It's not Ooh. popular yet. Like I'm not seeing a lot of uh, my contacts in the self-storage space come out with a lot of good deals yet. Um, but I would not be surprised in 2023, we start seeing better deals pop up where they start saying, hey, we got a great opportunity. And many times in the self-storage space, 15 to 20% returns aren't atypical. I mean, that can be common sometimes. So what might change in 2023 to, to make this more attractive? I think just uh, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, especially in the apartment space, I don't see a whole lot more apartment deals that are good. At least the good deal providers, they're, they're being very strict on making sure that they don't buy deals just because they're trying to invest money, right? They want to buy the right deals. And same thing happened with self-storage. There's a lot of people, especially after 2020, had a lot of influx of cash, started buying up stuff because they said, I heard this is good. Sometimes there's mom and pop people 
buying it. You know, people that are like doctors or dentists have no clue what they're doing and then they buy it. What will happen is because they don't know how to manage it and run it, they won't be seeing the returns and say, you know what? I want to get out from under this thing. Let me sell it. Oh, okay. And that okay. becomes the, the deal for you, right? Or the deal for that operator who then you can invest with. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of foreseeing that happening, especially in, with what, apartments and self-storage. What about things like, I've heard uh, a lot of people on social media, so I'll say it with an asterisk mark because I don't know for sure, but maybe you can enlighten us. Like, What about things people call like boring businesses, like car washes and laundromats mm-hmm. and even vending machines, things like that. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, actually, we just had a syndication recently that with one of our providers that had a car wash that was already up and running, operating and everything. And people can pool in money together to go and invest in that. Essentially, that's what you're really doing is those syndications. You have a share ownership, right? Um, now with businesses, I think it's a definite, a definite option. I would still be careful uh, because you know there is an element of speculation with business versus buying real estate, right? Um, now, here's an here's a ne- example of where you can mix the two together. Uh, one of our other syndications, the one that was really popular, especially with the guy, Dan, that I just mentioned earlier, um, he invested in what's referred to as mineral rights. So we have a contact where they actually buy the oil, the land, like in Oklahoma, for example. They'll buy a bunch of land before the oil companies do. But what they'll do is they'll buy the land and then they'll turn around and lease it to the oil companies. And not like the Exxon Mobiles where they waste money and they're not very profitable. Like the, usually the medium-sized companies are about a billion to five billion worth type of companies. They'll lease it to them. So those people are paying them rent for using that land. And the oil companies are also doing their own drilling and everything else. And all the profits they're making from, from the drilling, also you get a cut on that as well. So you get to double dip a little bit. You get to earn money from the lease, which is the guarantee, and you're getting money from the production. And that's not just oil. That's also natural gas, which is a natural byproduct when you drill oil. So, and that's becoming a big shortage right now, especially with Europe and Russia and everything going on there. Um, you know, natural gas is part of it. Obviously, if they find gold, silver, I mean, that's great. That's a bonus. But uh, generally, they're just really going for the minerals and that kind of thing. So, so th- there's money you could be making and, and really make good money. And I know I'm investing in that same kind of deal as well. And, you know, making roughly about 20% a year on that kind of thing. Nice. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you, uh, as my husband and I, Jeff, we were like sitting down and kind of thinking about this conversation and we were having like a larger conversation around generational wealth. We talked to somebody last week for the show and he was talking about building generational wealth in the African-American community. And it's interesting because we come from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Jeff's family it hasn't really created wealth and certainly hasn't created generational wealth. It's just kind of lived by getting by a paycheck to paycheck kind of thing. And my family is is different. My family has has done a lot of protection. There's a lot of life insurance and trusts and things like that established, but still hasn't created true generational wealth. Like like you're saying, buying apartment buildings and you know different things that could be passed on that could really turn into assets. And so. As we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about everybody listening to that's maybe really excited about this idea, but still kind of stuck in that that old frame thinking. And so, you know, I'm wondering how do we how do we just go about and kind of shift our mindset so that we can open up to the possibility that that everything that you're talking about could be possible for all of us listening. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, Generation, generational wealth really starts with education, right? It's about how do you create a legacy in your life? And, and so there's truth in both perspectives, you know, like, you know, I hear a lot of, uh, you know, financial advisors or especially insurance agents, they'll say, oh, well, generational wealth is created from your death benefit, from your life insurance, right? Um, and that goes into your estate plan, that goes into your, you know, like your, your bank of game, right? Your bog, you know, or whatever it might be, you know, or your, your estate plan, you know? And, and that's fine and dandy. But first and foremost, one, it's got to start with you. You know, you've got to great, create your own education. You've got to create your own wealth first. That's first. Second, you got to start teaching your children what you know. Um, I, I think it's cool because my wife is, you know, a great example of this. We have a blended family. And between the two of us, we have eight children. She has two. Wow. I have six. So it's a pretty crazy Brady Bunch that we've got here. And with her two children, she homeschools them and she teaches them. She's like, hey, I'm going to teach you about investing. And so we have a 12-year-old that's you know, earning money off of oil and gas, 
<laughs> you know, she's wow. making money off of that. She, her little investments going in to try to make some returns, you know, and, and she gets excited about it and trying to teach them, you know, not just about investing, but also how to think about money differently. Uh, even with my kids, I never, ever say the, the phrase, we can't afford it because it's not true. You can afford anything you prioritize, right? So teaching them is first. And then really secondly is ensuring that they can become wise stewards of their money too. So it's not like you just give them a bunch of money, like they're trust fund baby brats, right? We're really trying to help teach them and educate them along the way to do what you do. And if not do it better, I mean, I, how many times have I heard people tell us or tell me or, you know, my clients even say, man, I wish I knew this 20 years ago, you know, and we all say that, well, you have an advantage. You have children that could be learning this 20 years ago, right? From compared to your age or 30 years. So I think that's the, the real secret there is if you want to create generational wealth, you know, and it's not just, it's one, create it yourself and become a student yourself. And then two, become the teacher next and help pass that on to the next generation and beyond. I like that. I like that. It's, I like that way of thinking. Um, I think it's, I don't know, it's just super motivating that so many of the examples you've been given are all things that, that we can do. Mm -hmm. And I know we touched on this a little bit and you talked about like, okay, if you've got we're just throwing numbers out here on the wall, but let's say you've got, you know, 10 to $20,000 or so, like that needs to be your emergency fund, like keep that money. Is there a point where, like, is there a threshold where you're like, okay, now I can start looking into like really creating passive income? Is it 25,000, 50,000, or is it just really dependent on your, on your circumstances? It's, it's a little of both. I mean, 10, 20,000 is a great place to start. Um, now, if you do, like I said, like, you know, you're probably not gonna be doing a lot of these investments we're talking about with 10 or 20,000. I would recommend even before you worry about any of that stuff, um, get at least a hundred thousand saved up that you can access and use. Right. Um, in the meantime, most of the time it's going to be make sure you keep yourself protected by having that emergency fund in place. Cause you gotta you expect the best, but prepare for the worst, you know? So have yeah. that safety cushion there. But it doesn't mean you have to keep your money sitting in the bank doing nothing. You know, there's, there's things you can do. Like we mentioned that infinite banking concept, right? That you can do with money and create money with that. There's things like, I mean, even with, in our, within our academy, uh, we have people that are in that kind of group there um, where they might only have a little bit to invest. I mean, there are some investments that take a minimum of $100 or a minimum of $1,000 that you could start doing something with. Uh, I know my wife, even with, with her girls, she had already been saving like this kind of quasi education, you know, college type fund. Cause she's like, yeah, they could go into college, but they might become entrepreneurs like us. So she's creating this fund and maybe has like, you know, 10,000 bucks in it. Well, cool. We could put it in somewhere where just these smaller investments, maybe making nine or 10% returns off of that money, you know, and grow it in the meantime. So there's options for everybody. There's, there's always a place to start. Um, the key is if you're looking to do some of these bigger type of deals, you know, don't even worry about those until you're getting to like your hundred thousand plus of savings. But if you're in the smaller range, then you know, look at some other smaller strategies. You can just start with some very simple strategies to just kind of warm up to it and, and really learn and educate yourself in the process. All right, Chris. So 2023, many people have argued it's going to be the, the biggest new year, new you. So if I'm listening right now and I really want to start creating passive income, can you give us like like a pep talk or a few words of wisdom or even a little action list for how we can really get things going? You know, you know, for 2023, the biggest thing is really I would I would be playing some defense, you know, with your money, right? Um, you know, one is I would really be start to track your money, really start watching your money, like we talked about in our last episode, right? But really tracking your money, really staying lean and mean. You know, I I I talk about, uh, I said this in 2020, I'm going to give the same advice for 2023, which is get lean, get liquid and get out, you know, get lean in the sense of really controlling your expenses. Uh, I just met with a couple in their mid twenties yesterday, uh, blew my mind. She's 25 years old, just married, newly married. They just bought a home in California, well, Mojave desert, you know, but, uh, just bought a home in California and they've, they've got like almost like a hundred and you know, over a hundred thousand dollars, they could start saving and investing that they've saved and invested. Right. Wow. Uh, just incredible. And, and I even told them, I said, listen, we're going to take you on as clients just because, I mean, you're saving $7,000 a month of their income. You know, they're just keeping lean and mean with their money so that they can put away 7,000 a month, even though they're both 
employees. They both get killed with taxes more than any, you know, more than any of us that are business owners. And uh, I was like, you guys are on an amazing path. You guys could create some quick freedom. Um, so, so with them, it's like, yeah, they're, they're lean to the point where they're saving $7,000 a month, even though they didn't have enough money usually for us to take them on as clients. We said, Hey, listen, with the rate rate you're saving, we can still create some amazing results for you. Keep it up. Let's, let's keep that momentum going. So get lean, getting liquid means like, don't lock it up in prison. Right. And then get out. This could mean that if you've got money that you've already lost, maybe 20% plus in the stock market right now. It, it doesn't mean that you have to cash it out, but maybe you move it into some more conservative accounts just to preserve the principle you have in there. You know, maybe you move it to like a money market account or fund or something like that, just to because even bonds right now we can't trust because even some of the bonds have been losing money this year. So if things like that, just to really get prepared and then start getting the education. That's why I mean, not to, to sound too self serving, but you know, our Money Ripples podcast, just like your podcast, right? I mean we're talking money, you know, we're talking and trying to educate you and get you to expand your mind, keep building that education and that knowledge base. And then when you feel ready, great. And that's right. That's time to take action. But sometimes the best action you take right now is just be prepared. I've really been thinking a lot about this conversation with Chris about how we're all just lulled into this belief that saving money and contributing to our retirement accounts, that's the only way to build wealth. I can tell you after working with a lot of really wealthy people that this is not how they were able to build wealth. And most of those people, they started from scratch. They didn't inherit money. They literally started from ground up. So maybe Chris has you thinking about how you can balance all the stuff you should do, like building a strong emergency fund. And yes, take advantage of your company 401k match because it's free money. But then think outside of the traditional financial advice and ways that you can also build passive income. I don't know about you, but I am pretty excited about this idea. If you want to learn more and connect with Chris, you can find everything, including his podcast, on his website, moneyripples.com. If you enjoyed this episode, you know what to do. Shout it out to someone else who is also interested in building passive income. You can head to those show notes for all the links to our episode guests, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. I'll see you right back here in a few days for a brand new episode. 